ask you to, to if if you're willing um, to move into the center because as people come in they're always trying to find seating and then you know how it goes people always love to sit on the ends but um, but if you, if you just be cognizant of folks coming in to find seats that would be great that would be great you know that we always start at about 9:34. That seems to be the, that seems to be the adult uh, forum time to begin. So I think we're right on schedule, actually. So it's good. I want to welcome you, and I want to welcome those who are at home because we are live streaming uh, this class, this conversation. Um, and just to say a word about that, you know. It is so great to be in the Miller Chapel for adult education. Don't you agree? Yes. We're, we have been in Fellowship Hall until the Miller Chapel has been, was re renovated. And I just think this is a great space. And I think um, teachers and speakers really think this is a great space. So I hope you agree that this is a great space to have it. And we get to be um, live streamed and recorded, which we have been asked for many years, can you record the adult class? But um, no, it's been, it was been, it was been hard. So we're lucky to have this. So welcome to those who are on live stream or who'll be watching this uh, later today. We are very fortunate um, to have the Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber with us in adult education, adult faith for formation. Uh, Nadia preached a, a uh, I won't say it, a wonderful sermon um, this morning already at the 8.30 service on a very difficult parable. Um, so I hope for those of you who weren't there in the morning that you will be at the 11 a.m. service because it was, it was challenging and uh, um, affirming and beautiful as Nadia always preaches. Nadia is a resident theologian, that's what we like to call her here, and she is also a uh, pastor of public witness for the ELCA, the Synod of the Rocky Mountains. She's in covenant as well with the, uh, the Episcopal Cathedral, St. John's Episcopal Cathedral, and New Beginnings Worshiping Community in the Women's Correctional Institu Institution. And uh, so she has a broad uh, calling and a, um, a very rich calling in, in this place in Denver. So we're fortunate to have her. This is our fourth session on the series on the New Testament. How many of you have been to the first three? Can I ask? Did you yeah. get your cards punched? Do you have a punch card? <laughs> frequent, frequent Bible flyers. Thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you to Timothy Beale, who led us off in, in great, uh, great scholarship in the first three sessions. And Nadia gets to bring us to a bit of the practical of preaching the parables. Um, preaching the parables is a challenge, but a good challenge. And so we're going to have a little bit of a discussion in, in uh, this way, which really means Nadia is going to talk. So that's, that's the truth. Um, just a reminder that parables are stories, stories, great stories that Jesus told. They say that there's somewhere between 30 and 100, is what I've heard, in parables in the Synoptic Gospels, um, Mark and Matthew and Luke. But at, at least over 30 um, parables that he, that he taught. Can have, we, have we gone over Synoptic? Did we, have we done that? Yes, um, yeah, yes, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, th but you, you can if you'd like. Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm sure I could improve on uh, the doctor. <laughs> the doctors. In case Timothy Your husband hasn't has a done PhD enough. PhD in biblical <laughs> You're almost a doctor. <laughs> yes. Um, I, you know what? I'll just do it really quick yeah, just because yeah, everyone sure, wasn't sure. here. So the yeah, synoptic yeah, yeah. just means the ones that look really similar to each other, uh, that they look alike, synoptic. So um, which is uh, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. They, they kind of look the same. And then John's like its own thing entirely. Okay, <laughs> go on. <laughs> Sorry. That is right. <laughs> John's like, I'm over here. Um, parables are usually uh, confounding and uh, confusing and ambiguous, hyperbolic. Um, and we don't always get that, I think, because there's uh, some 
customs in the ancient world that we might be missing, and so unpacking that. And one of my uh, favorite things is, and Tim and I talked about this yesterday, when Jesus was asked, why do you teach in parables? And basically he says, to confuse people, you know? <laughs> For those who have ears to hear and those who have, have minds to understand, but, but basically he says, you know, to confuse people, to make it hard, you gotta work at this. So um, I think this is a great place to start because the preacher's task is, is hard and challenging. Yeah. And so Nadia, just talk about what is the preacher or the sermon's task yeah. using a oh, parable. I love that. Well, it's the, it's the same task as using any other text, I would say. Mm -hmm. it's, just, um, it's just a little more challenging with parables, but I would say a little, a little more fun. And mm -hmm. it, uh, since I'm a Lutheran theologian, Lutherans have a very, very, very particular view of what preaching is. And when I started hanging out with evangelicals, I don't know if you've heard the, the term teaching pastor. Uh, I'd never heard that term, but when I was hanging out with evangelicals, they'd talk about who their teaching pastor was. And I literally thought it was the person who was like in charge of adult ed in Sunday school. We, but we actually preacher. use that term. Oh, you yeah, do? we use teaching oh. elders, oh. and that's the minister of word and sacrament, and ruling elders, which is our, our ruling elders who... Oh. manage the government. Well, yeah. in, in the Lutheran tradition, teaching and preaching are just entirely different functions. Oh. And so in the, the evangelicals I'd meet, their teaching pastor, that meant it was their preacher. Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. it. And so for, for Lutherans, teaching and preaching are just very different functions. Um, a lot of times if uh, you'll hear a sermon and it feels like you're just getting a lot of information you know, mm -hmm. about the text, mm -hmm. like, oh, right. a, lot of, a lot of historical stuff and comparing yeah. it to this and details about what it was like in the first century. Yeah. And, there, and there's nothing wrong with having information in a mm -hmm. sermon. But for me, it always should only be included if it serves a really particular function. And the function right. is that somehow there has to be some good news mm -hmm. and the good news has to be something that is related to God and not us. And so what mm -hmm. serves mm -hmm. as preaching in, in a lot of times in, in liberal and conservative circles both is some version of here's the problem and here's what you should be doing about it. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem, here's what you could be doing about it. Yeah. And I've never once in my life heard that as good news. Uh, <laughs> like more just, shame, more guilt. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. just uh, you know we could all be trying harder, and it's like oh my god, yes, eternally true. We could all be trying harder. Also, I've tried trying harder. It doesn't make me free. It just makes me tired. So yeah. none of it like has I found very helpful. So when I hear a sermon that somehow we we in the Lutheran tradition we call it law and gospel preaching, law, L-A-W, law and gospel preaching. And what it means is that in some way we're looking at the text and we're going, here's something that kind of convicts us in the text, right? Here's something that, um, that shows me that maybe uh, I don't have everything it takes to be good, mm -hmm. everything to be righteous. Mm -hmm. There's no way that I can do everything perfectly. Some way of looking at... Uh, the, like we kind of look at the bad news first, but only because uh, it's really hard to understand why the good news is good if we're not willing to maybe take a glimpse at why the bad news is bad when mm -hmm. it comes to humans. Mm -hmm. And so it's not to make us feel guilty, but it's, it's, to, ma it's to make us ready to hear mm -hmm. uh, who God is for, on our behalf. And so, I, so in a parable, um, it, 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 there's almost this extra layer of challenge. And by the way, parables are stories. I think you should probably know if you've ever visited the Holy Land or if you plan to, there will be tour guides who will show you the actual place on the road to Jericho where the Good Samaritan was found. Um, that's a story, by the way. That's not... <laughs> the, the parable of the Good Samaritan was literally a made-up story Jesus made. So there's not a literal place on that road where he was found, <laughs> just to be clear. But this is what our brain tries to do. We try to find out what's the sort of literal truth? What's the mm -hmm. factual thing? What's the moral? And I get to this in my sermon, like what's the moral of the story? Mm -hmm. And yet mm -hmm. um, sometimes these stories that are so familiar, like the Good Samaritan or the mm -hmm. Prodigal Son, they're so like 
embedded, mm -hmm. ingrained in our mm -hmm. heads that it, um, I love it when a preacher can show me that story from a completely different angle right. because scripture itself is, um, it is an endless well of meaning. Mm -hmm. It's endless and that it's this endless reservoir of meaning. And if we struggle enough with it, we, we will find something. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't believe how many times I've preached on the same exact text, and right. I'll find something new in it, Absolutely. which is extraordinary to me. This is what makes, this is one of the ways I know it is sacred text, mm -hmm. is that uh, if you put in the work, it will, it will hand over the goods every time. Mm -hmm. and, and I often approach it completely faithlessly. Like, I'll be like, oh my God, I have to preach the Pentecost text again? Like, I've had a pretty good run, but it's probably over now. There's <laughs> yes, no totally. way I'll find <laughs> something. Yeah. No way. The jig and, is up. And my, yeah. my favorite example of me approaching the text like that, uh, it was Pentecost, and it was the mm. first time that we'd worshipped at the St. John's Cathedral since the pandemic. The mm. first time that they had in-person worship was Pentecost 2021. We had not been together, you know, to worship. Mm -hmm. If you guys remember, there was that wilderness we walked through and um, for a very long time not being able to gather. And they asked if I would preach. And the Pentecost text, the opening line, which always felt like the text was clearing its throat. Honestly, I never even thought about the opening line of this text. Like if someone said, hey, if there's one you'd vote off the island, I'd be like, well, probably that one. Who cares about that line? And yet we had experienced something different. And so uh, the first line of the Pentecost text says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And it makes me teary even thinking of it. And I definitely cried a little bit when I said it in my sermon. So here's this text. It had been sleeping. It had just been dozing off for generations, waiting for us to experience a pandemic so that when we look, read it again, we would be like, oh my God, I can't even get past the first verse. Look at how shining with meaning that is, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I love scripture for that. It, like, it mm -hmm. is faithful to us. We keep, there's so many conversations about like, how can we be faithful to the Bible? Why don't we have conversations mm -hmm. about how faithful the Bible is to us? Mm -hmm. That it, there's always gonna be something mm -hmm. in it for us to struggle with. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I, you know, preparing for this sermon, she said, you guys are doing parables. I was like, I want to preach on the worst one I can think of. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I was raised in a very, uh, very Bible-centered home. And like some kids, when they were growing up, would argue with their siblings about like what their favorite superhero was or their favorite relief pitcher. We, we were like, what's your favorite plague? We, we did, we, I, like, we had, we laid claim to, we, and the other kids couldn't I'll have that one if you claimed it. My sister was kind of a softy, so hers was darkness. I'm like, what a lame one. That's not a great Frogs. plague. Frogs. Are you kidding? And my brother was disgusting, so he was like boils, you know, that was his favorite. And I wasn't getting along with him, so mine was death of the firstborn. So, uh, <laughs> Anyway, so I, I, I chose, I still have favorites and least favorites, and the parable of the, um, of, the, of the foolish bridesmaids is the one I preached on today. It's definitely, I think, my least yeah. favorite. So. Talk about that process. So you have this <clears throat> difficult, the hardest mm -hmm. parable for you, mm -hmm. or one you like the least, yeah. and then what? It's always those texts where, and I preach difficult texts here. I almost always start my sermon in some way by confessing how much I don't like the text I'm about to <laughs> preach on. I realized it's like this kind of quirk in my preaching and I've done that here several times. But you know, sometimes when I was at House for All Sinners and Saints, uh, sometimes we, we, we have the tradition where we'd say, you know, hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord, and you read the Gospel. The Gospel of the Lord. And everyone says, praise to you, O Christ. But sometimes the Gospel text was so harsh mm -hmm. that you could tell the congregation was like, 
Yeah. Praise to you, oh Christ. Like, why are we saying thank you for this text? So, yeah, totally. Uh, that, so those are the ones I sort of almost prefer to try to preach on because mm. it's, it demands more. Yeah. And so here I am looking at the text and going, um, like, for me, preaching is like a wrestling match mm -hmm. between me and the text. And I take the community that I will be preaching for into that wrestling text with the text. And I, I will not walk away from it before demanding a blessing from mm -hmm. it. And then when I walk away, I walk away limping, just to have another biblical reference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, that's what I'm doing. I just absolutely insist in finding some good news. And sometimes the only way to find the good news in a text is to do what I did in this sermon, which is to read it through the lens of another text. Yeah. And so, you know, I was raised in a really kind of fundamentalist Christian house where, or church, I would say not house, but church, where they were like, the Bi I would often hear the preacher say something like, the Bible is very clear. Uh, and then when I started reading it for myself, yes, I was like, right, the Bible right, is, is not, not at all clear. clear. Right. I mean, the it's Bible isn't a book, it's a library. It's like going into my, you go and look at my, this big bookshelf that I have, and you're like, what does your, what does your bookcase have to say about X? Like, you can't do that, right, you know? Right. And so right. um, there was this sense that the Bible was clear that uh, you could take every single thing in the Bible literally, mm -hmm. and, um, and, it, mm -hmm. and there was just a clear meaning there, and that's not how I've experienced it. Like we, it, it, Lutherans really believe that, um, we believe in what's called a canon within the canon. If you've heard the word canon in scripture, it's like the books that made the cut eventually, you know, over the like generations into the Bible. That's the canon. And, um, Lutherans believe there's a canon within the canon. Uh, and so uh, we, we believe the gospel is the canon within the canon. So any text that is related to the good news of who Jesus is, is absolutely central in this sort of big bullseye of what the Bible is. That is central. Mm -hmm. And so any text that is, that's always gonna have the most authority to us and then any text that says, that gives a similar message or in some way helps us to see the gospel clearer or to understand it, maybe it's not really a text about Jesus specifically, but if it's like related, mm -hmm. then that has authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and as it gets farther and farther from it, it has less and less authority to us. So people will mm -hmm. be like, oh, you have this opinion about something? Well what do you do with this verse? And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't have a dog in that fight. Like if that verse is not directly about the gospel, I don't have to in some way defend my stance against it, you know? And are you saying that with a sermon or are you, are you saying that generally? Uh, both, I would yeah. say both. I'm, I mean, I almost always preach from the gospels. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty rare that I don't. Mm -hmm. But that's because I'm a Lutheran preacher, mm -hmm. you know? So um, mm -hmm. I've preached from Psalms and some Hebrew Bible texts but in some epistles, but I would say 90, 95 percent mm -hmm. of my sermons mm -hmm. are from the Gospels. Well, they're, they're interesting stories, yeah. both of what Jesus did and then what Jesus is saying, right. using as a story, yeah. and the story of right. common life. People understand right. the, his examples. It's yeah. like this. The kingdom of God is like this, and they... Can and lean if, in. Yeah, and the, if the if the first people listening to it were confused and didn't get it, how dare we be so arrogant to think that we do get it yeah, right away? Very it simple. To this thing. Absolutely. Yeah, Here's package. what it means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. because kind of like that that um, Pentecost text example. Every time I read the text, the wor something different is happening in the world. The world has changed. Mm -hmm. I have changed. Yep. And so, therefore, it's going to bring, hopefully, bring something different mm -hmm. to the surface for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and, and inspiration, that's where we would say mm -hmm. the inspiration is in, in the act of the, the faith of reading and, mm -hmm. and engaging and wrestling and trusting that the Spirit is there. Totally. It is not, yeah. it, our ego needs to get out of the way, too, oh. right, in that process, because you, you have that 
person or the, the, the image. And this is just true for preachers. I don't know for you. You preach in a lot of space that you might not know the people. Yeah. But, but as a preacher for a particular community, you know, we've, we know what a lot of you are going through, mm. right? We work pastorally with you. Mm. So if we're working with a text, mm -hmm. we often have a person. Would you say that, Eve? If you of, often have a person or a situation going on that, that would seem almost um, irresponsible not to address or be in conversation right. with. And, and so you hope you're bringing something, uh, I, don't, I hate the word relevant, uh, but something um, personal and, and, and worthy of connection to your lives. And some people come out and go, I felt like you were preaching to me. And I'm like, I was. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I, I did the same at House for All Sinners and Saints. I would have somebody in their situation in mind when I was yeah. preaching, and just they would usually not show up that Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, Almost always. Or, or it's a, the experience of when someone comes out and goes, that meant so much to me when you said that. And you're like, I did not say All that. All the time. I All did not. Time. Say that. When I you did said not this, say it that. It meant so, so much, much, and I was like, "That was not what you emotional. needed." But I didn't say it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. the, that's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you know, yeah, she's yeah. very sneaky. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so, process. Um, what about these stories that are? It, it seems like uh, parables always have a little bit of it that shocking element or the inversion or you thought this but it's actually this and Jesus often explains well this is what it means it's like explaining a joke so it loses yeah. you know it loses a little bit of the of the of the fun of it but um, but what, are there are there parables that you think that's a great one because there's a shock element I to actually it? I don't know Tim if, if this is true I actually kind of assume that there's only a few times where he's like, he explains it, mm -hmm. right? You see, as Tim it, says to private. the duh disciples yeah, in Mark. Yeah, the duh disciples, yeah. yeah. But I kind of assume that what those verses were added. I, I mm. very much seriously doubt. I think they kind of figured it out, and when they were reading like, it, no they were like, this. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I... Uh, I love how difficult they are. I mean, if it was, if these were really simple texts, um, they would not be offering us quite so much afresh every generation. That's what I think. So um, that that I, there are times where I'll post sermons, my sermons online, and somebody, usually a preacher, will argue with me. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I, this text is about this, you know, and I'm like, dude, like. I, all I was doing was saying, in this moment in time, yep. for this community, and for who I am in the moment that I was writing and preaching it, mm -hmm. this is what the word is, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I may preach a sermon a year later on the same text that contradicts every yeah. single thing yeah. I said that it was about, yep. and it's fair game. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I need it to be a living... It, it, I mean, yep. if we think it's a living word then that's what we are saying it can do. Yeah. That, that's, how, that's what we're saying. This is the way it can be faithful to us, is that it, was, that it is living. Mm -hmm. It will hand over goods that we need in the yeah. moment. And that might be a, a word that contradicts what we said it was a year ago, yeah. and it's all good. Yeah, yeah. So, and the danger and challenges, a preacher, the, the danger is that, that now that worship is videoed mm -hmm. and archived, and someone can take issue with how you interpreted a text maybe five years ago when you were in a different place or yeah. 10 years ago totally. and it gets locked in and oh, you go, yeah. yeah, well, I've grown. I think right. The Apostle Paul, I think we don't give him you know, some credit right. for growing right. in right. understanding yeah. or any That's authors right. and That's right. you know, just like, this it's is It's the alive. problem with, with writing memoir too is I was being interviewed at Bright uh, Divinity a couple weeks ago, and the guy kept referencing stuff that I wrote about myself mm. 14 years ago, yeah. and in wanting me to comment on it, and I kept going like, I, I'm not the yeah. same person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mm. mean, that allowance for it to be more than one thing and for it to change, I think is, is desperately important to yeah. faithfulness. So I, uh, there is, um, 
I also think that uh, scripture is robust and strong enough for us to question it, for us to um, dislike it, for mm -hmm. us to argue. Like, it, it, it's sturdy enough. It, it's held up for generations of this, right? So um, we don't have to, like, it doesn't have to be encased in amber as something that we then, like, worship, that it's, it's pretty yeah. sturdy. It can hold up against yeah. it. And fearful. I think a lot of people are just fearful of getting in there because they are afraid that they're not going to read it right. Mm. You know, that there's a way that they should mm. be able to um, mm. engage with this mm. very strange mm. text written so many centuries. Mm. And, and so it just feels like sometimes there's an aversion to it as well. Yeah, but we need, we need, so, we need a multitude of interpreters of the text. Yeah. So I read it as, as a woman, as somebody mm -hmm. who has my life story, as a recovering alcoholic. Like mm -hmm. that's the, the lens that I'm bringing yeah. into that interpretive yeah. event. But at, at House for All Sinners and Saints, when I was there, I got to study the text with people who were queer, transgender, mm -hmm. or had di completely different life experiences. and they are going to see something in yeah. it I'm not going to see in That's it. Right. And I need to. And right. it, it's enriching to me. That's Did right. you talk about Mark Allen Powell's stuff with the parables? Oh, God. There's this scholar who took the parable of the prodigal son. If you remember the parable of the prodigal son, that, that he, uh, a son demanded his inheritance early, and he took it, and he went to a another country and he sort of wasted it on dissolute living which which is uh a great yeah dissolute it means uh I, I think it means hookah whores and hooch and uh, that's what i say anyway so uh that's um and so he w he squandered it on dissolute living <laughs> And then there was a famine in the land, and then he didn't have anything, and he ends up having to like lit, take care of these pigs, and he he couldn't even like eat their leftovers, and he was starving. And suddenly he's like, oh, you know what? Even the servants in my father's house, even they have bread to eat. I'll go, and I will, um, I will, you know, say to my father, uh, I'm so sorry, and he'll bring me back just as a servant. And he comes back, and before he can even get close to the house, the father sees him and runs out, and he, before he can get his totally rehearsed speech out of his mouth, he just says, um, I, you know, let's throw a party for what was lost is found, and all of this, and they have this party, and the older brother comes in from the field, the guy who'd done everything right his whole life, and he's like, what's the party about? And they're like, your no good little brothers come back, and he's like, our dad, nev our dad ne never even kills a little lamb for me to have with my friends, and yet he's throwing this guy a party, and the father runs out again, you know, abandoning his dignity, running out to his no-good children in the street, and he says, uh, you know, but everything I've had has always been yours, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this is a parable of the, of the prodigal son, the naughty standard version. And then, <laughs> so Mark Allen Powell goes to these very different groups of people. I'm not, I'm not going to remember this exactly, but this is the gist. He reads the text uh, out loud, has people read it, who were from very different contexts. One is like kind of prep school, New Englander prep school people. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, some people from, I think it's Uganda, uh, and then uh, Eastern Europe. And, and he reads it, and they read it, and then he says, tell the story, tell it to your friends. And he records how they tell it. Mm -hmm. And he notices what do they leave out and what do they add in each context. Mm -hmm. And then he asks them the question, why was the younger brother uh, in a situation in which he didn't have anything to eat? He was so desperate. Mm -hmm. And the... Uh, the people in, I think it was Uganda, said um, it's because he thought he could live uh, without his people. He thought he could survive mm. without his tribe. That's why. And then uh, the people in somewhere in Eastern Europe said, um, it, I can't remember what their answer was, but the prep schoolers in New England said it's because he was irresponsible. 
because he didn't have this, he didn't have enough personal responsibility mm. to do what was right with his money. And the thing that the prep school New Englanders left out of the story, every single one when they were taken into a room and said, retell it, not one of them mentioned that the reason he was hungry is there was a famine in the land. Not one of them. Oh, the one in the Eastern Europe, they're the ones who caught on to it. They're like, it's because there was a famine, because they'd experienced famine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mm. what that tells us is mm -hmm. like, if we're arrogant enough to think that from our own social location, our interpretation of a text is mm -hmm. what it is about for all right. people in all right. time, right. 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 we are killing the living word. Yeah. And so there has to be this humility of going, I don't know, here's what I see, but like, what do you see? Yeah. And the fact that we might read a text like that and just conveniently forget that there was a famine in the land and that's why he was hungry, mm -hmm. says more about us than it does yes. about the text. Yes. Yes. When uh, feminist interpreters in the 70s really started engaging with the text and became you know, more popular, um, uh, more, more common as interpreters, these feminist scholars, and they were seeing things that had been left out entirely. Or when, when black theologians, black biblical scholars started reading the text, things were revealed that had never been revealed. So this canon white German, you know, males, yeah, right. uh, canon, uh, they were, be, it was, the, ch the interpretations were being challenged, you know, over and over and over again. And so in the parables, in my limited uh, memory of this in, in seminary, the, the feminist scholars were saying, God is the woman searching for the lost coin. Right. God is the, the, the hen gathering up her chicks. And right. so just twisting, right. like, Wait, wait, God is the feminine, and so they just opening up. So it depends on what lens through which you are reading. What is your subjectivity in what you're bringing to the text itself? And, and that's exciting. And it's all fair game. Yeah. Or some of the, you know, Matthew's gospel has a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth and outer darkness and <laughs> that's, port portents and destruction. That's when, sorry, I had an experience with my, um, one of these humorous, with my colleague in uh, my church in Cleveland. And, uh, and it was the, the separation of the sheep and the goats, mm -hmm. Matthew 25. And, you know, and there will be gnashing, and, uh, gnashing of teeth and, and cast into outer darkness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. And, and I turned to him and I said, "Good luck." <laughs> you know? It's just totally. so so totally. jarring. Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah. But then, how does it change if you read it through a theology of the cross to say, mm -hmm. you know, God was most potently present in this moment of absolute suffering, and God mm -hmm. is most present in God forsakenness, right? Yep. Then how yep. does the outer, what does the outer darkness mm -hmm. mean mm -hmm. if we read it through a theology of the cross? Is that where God's mm -hmm. just waiting for us, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, it's all up for grabs. Yeah. I love it. I love it. What time are we at? 106. I think we should do some questions. Are yeah, you okay? Question. Sure. Nadia calls them questions and opinions. Yeah, Q and O. Q and O. I don't have answers, but yeah, I have a lot yeah, of opinions. We got a lot of opinions, but, <laughs> but it's great. And I, I'm assuming you'll have questions, and so I think it's it's wonderful to talk with y'all. Um, yep. Any any. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I was wondering. You spoke about. God being most present in God forsakenness, mm -hmm. what do you suppose that it means for him to be there? Mm -hmm. And is he more present or are we more able to see him and blame him? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great, that's, that's a great actually question. really a genius question. Yeah, um, so I guess there's a, there's this, question in theology that's plagued theologians throughout time. It's called theodicy, which is about suffering, right? It's about how, why, how could a God who is loving allow suffering? And so uh, the, I was talking about like a theology of the cross. Well, there's, there's something that's an, the opposite of theology of the cross. It's called theology of glory. 
So a theology of glory is where we find what we expect to find and we see that righteousness exists in exaltation and it exists in winning and it exists in, you know, um, uh, progressive sanctification, you know, like this is a theology of glory. But where does the theology of glory leave humans who are in suffering? It, it, it says to humans who suffer um, that God is not present in it, that somehow you are suffering because God has forsaken you. So a theology of the cross actually rejects that idea and says that if, if the most reliable way of knowing who God is to Christians is to see who God, how God chose to reveal who God is in the person of Jesus Christ, and that the conclusion of our human need to figure things out, judge things, put things in the right category, and our human need to condemn, if the logical conclusion of that is the crucifixion of Jesus, is to say, it's, is, is to sort of cause the suffering of God. And God bore all of it um, and didn't even lift a finger to condemn those who put God there. Didn't, like, God's response was forgiveness. Even in that moment was forgiveness. That turns all of our natural instincts upside down. Mm -hmm. And so if our natural instinct is to go, where is God in glory and, and uh, in success and in uh, exaltation, then we are, we're continual, that continually, kind of like in the parables, is being flipped upside down. There's like this inversion in it. And so to say that God chose to take all of that on and respond in the least intuitive way, if not how I would respond if I were God. How I would respond if I were God is like the old hymn says, he could have called 10,000 angels, right? Like I, I would have availed myself of the power mm -hmm. that was at my disposal, and God chose not to. Mm -hmm. And so there's this way in which that tells me that, that, that God is most present, not most present, but maybe we're able to actually, you're right, actually mm -hmm. sense the presence of God in the suffering. And I, I think that's why, like right now, I, I'm, in the, I'm at the women's prison twice a week, and it's not work that's like for everyone, but for me, um, I. I love to be there because there's just, there's no pretense of a theology mm -hmm. of glory in that place. Mm -hmm. And in my sermon today, I talk about that God knows us most when we, in our need for God, not in our independence from God. And so there's, there's a need for God's intervention in that place that's so salient that I really love to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a place of suffering. So... Mm -hmm. Mm. There, there's no easy answer here, mm. <laughs> but that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I was born and raised Catholic. This is my first time in a non-Catholic environment. Oh, welcome. They're welcome. all exactly like this. Yeah. Um, you should and, know. <laughs> and we say we are the fastest growing Catholic church in, uh, in Denver. No, we, you are in good company. Yeah, you guys have a few uh, former Catholics here. We have uh, many, yes. Approximately yes, all yes. of them. Yes. yes. I don't know Anyhow, if you can sorry. be former Catholic, but anyway, Anyhow, go ahead. press on. Yeah. Thank you. I also work in healthcare, mm. and I had this insight this morning about how many times healing can only occur in the place where the hurt occurred. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you can speak about that. There was something that happened. I've been away from church for a long time because of hurt that happened yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And I see a lot of patients that are hurt in the very system that's supposed to help them heal. Yeah. And so people leave these environments that are supposed to be there to help them be yes, well. I know. And then they leave for a long time, and then they come back, and there's a lot of damage and things to recover and repair. And, yeah. But this idea that, like, we have to go back to the very place yeah. that hurt us. Mm. I know. And I don't know why you did the sign of the cross, but no. it was very healing oh. for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Coming from where I come from. Yeah. So, can, oh. And I read something in your sexual revolution book mm -hmm. about, like, I needed to go back to Christianity yeah. because it was where I come from. Yeah. And I'd not seen the relationship between religion and healthcare. So That's I don't know if I have a specific no, question. I think that's but. great. 
Well, first I want to say I'm Lutheran and we cross ourselves. So that's a, so Lutherans are just like uh, one degree away from Catholics. Um, Presbyterians are like, what, four? I'd say four degrees? I don't know. <laughs> John, anyway, I John don't know. Calvin's like, He's yeah, rolling maybe, in his yeah, grave. Yeah, yeah. No, no, he, um, he liked Lutheran. Yeah, Luther, yeah. Just not. Yeah, great. So, um, but uh, I, I had 10, I had a decade of my life where I couldn't have anything to do with Christianity. A decade uh, where something had to heal in me before I could ever come back. And it's like, a, it's a very, when, when you're raised in a, in a religious symbol system and practice, you know, your brain is developing, right? All of these things are forming during that time and when you have to leave it for reasons of self-preservation, mm -hmm. it creates an alienation in you, or it created an it created an alienation in me mm -hmm. that um, that I carried until I could ever until I could come back. I mean, to be alienated from your spiritual symbol system is very painful, even when even if you're angry about it, even if you had to leave for self-preservation. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a kind of healing that happens when you can c return to that symbol system on your own terms um, in ways that um, I've, I've felt things knit back together within me mm -hmm. from that. Um, it, that it has been really powerful. Obviously that then became my like, career and my work. Mm -hmm. But if you had told the me who left the Church of Christ when I was 16 and didn't go back to Christianity until I was about 27. If you had told me that eventually I'll be a pastor and a preacher and a theologian, I'd be like, you got the wrong girl, you know? I was determined that my path was only gonna be away from and never toward. But mm -hmm. for me, the toward became, it was 10 times more liberating to come back than it was to leave because mm. that is yeah. mine. Those hymns yeah. are mine. Those psalms are mine. Those prayers are mine. I did not want to continue to have an alienation from them if I didn't have to. And it's a, it's a recent idea in human history that we can like choose our symbol system. You know, we're so used to that. We can just choose where we go, what we believe. But, you know, up until recently, that's, that was where you stayed your whole life, you know? So mm -hmm. it's very human to, to be part of a symbol system that you're, that you, developed your awareness of yourself in the world and the divine within. And so mm -hmm. to me, the returning in a healthy way can be, can be really healing. Even mm -hmm. now, I'm not going to go back to a church that women are allowed. I did not hear a woman speak out loud in a Christian worship service till I was 27 years old. So I, I could not ever go back to that. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, but I'm so glad that I, I got to come back home in a way it, it, as my whole self was very healing, mm -hmm. continues to be. Mm -hmm. And then I think my work has been sort of maybe just trying to invite people who are also, you know, who also need to come back to come back. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I talked to... Um, I wouldn't say often, but often enough. And I did campus ministry for about 10 years. And, and you know, so many people feel like the tradition they were raised in, whether fundamentalist or evangelical or whatever the tradition they might have been raised in, and they're trying, it doesn't fit anymore, right? The clothes don't fit anymore, and they need to try on something new. But, but they, over and over again, I've heard... I just can't do Christianity anymore. I'm done. Yeah. And I, or I just don't believe in God anymore. And yeah. I say, tell me about the God you don't believe in. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, yeah. Me, tell me about the Christianity that you're rejecting because there's, there's a lot more, mm. you know, and I'll tell you about the God I believe in. Right. Um, you're like, oh, I don't believe in that God either. Exactly. Yeah. No. It's yeah. exactly. Well, that's we right. That, it's we like we have that in common. common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. And that's, a, and that's a, you know, that's the challenge. It's like, what are you rejecting? Or, and I would go as the Bible, too. Just, you know, I can't read the Bible. Or I don't understand sure. it and all that. It's like, well, just, just know what you're rejecting or know what you're yeah. holding off. Because um, there's there's more there. Also, right now for me, I've been I've been really trying to pay attention to 
um, if I've changed, sometimes I just revert to impersonating older versions of myself, mm -hmm. and I have, mm -hmm. yep. and like, it, I haven't realized, oh, like, actually something's changed, yeah. and that's been, maybe it's being in my 50s, but I just, um, like, there are things I had such strong opinions about mm -hmm. earlier in my life that if I just repeat the opinions over and over, mm -hmm. I can't, like, take a moment to contemplatively check in and go, do I even care about mm -hmm, that anymore? Mm -hmm. Do I even, is it serving me? Is that really who I am? So I, mm -hmm. I, part of leading a more contemplative life is being able to be aware of when these things, these proclamations we've made about who we are, what we think, what we believe, might need to, an, 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 an update, mm -hmm. you know? And I think as pastors, that's such a, a seductive thing to do is we become caricatures of ourselves, right? Caricatures of a pastor. Mm -hmm. This is what a pastor says, this is what a pastor does. And then you, you become detached from like, mm -hmm. well, wait, what is it really that I believe? What has changed in me? Right. What am I bringing right. Right. that's different right. um, as we age, as yeah. we develop? Yeah. Yeah. Question. Um, can we leave space in our faithful lives for skepticism? I, I do think that for those of us, I, I think we all in the world are looking for truth, but at the same time we can acknowledge that even if we sort of come to some understanding that it's, it's tenuous at best, right? Yeah. So yeah. late Christopher Dawkins ends one of his books at saying it's very difficult to accept an all-powerful God with an all-loving God. And I, and I think back to the disciples, and I recognize that here they were in Christ's presence, and they themselves were still skeptical. And I don't, I don't think that modern faithful traditions embrace the notions of this need for rationalization with things that are, unfortunately for all of us, inherently unknowable at the level that we really ask for in our lives. No, I think you're right. I mean, this is the problem with being post-Enlightenment religious people mm -hmm. because the enlightenment like basically changed it, it was an epistemological revolution it changed mm -hmm. the way we thought about thinking and the way that we have it and our whole understanding of the world and ourselves so now we have a, we we understand the power of human reason and we have the scientific method we have this way of verifying if something is true or not mm -hmm. right well we have we have a way of verifying if something's fact or not but not true. And so it makes it challenging because we, we, faith is a different order of understanding. It's a different order of reality than, than reason and the scientific method, which we're just sort of drenched in uh, as post-enlightenment people. And so people will be like, well, do you, do you think that it's like a fact that Jesus was like born of a virgin? I'm like, is it a fact? Oh, that feels unknowable. Is it true? Totally true. Absolutely true. <laughs> but is it fact? I'm very skeptical. I don't know. Right? So these are different ways of knowing. They yeah. are. Yeah. So um, to go like, yeah, I have skepticism on some of the factual stuff, but, um, but the truth it contains, I feel in my body. Like mm -hmm. this is, um, oh, this is my thing about Paul. Uh, Paul's letters is that, um, so I, have t I serve two different functions. When I'm speaking in front of people, I'm either being a speaker or I'm being a preacher. Now, uh, if I'm a, I have some authority to say what I say as a preacher, as a speaker, because, you know, I was a church planter and I can read the culture, pretty good communicator, know some, some, some stuff, but mostly it's my snotty opinions, right? Based in having some authority in this moment to say those snotty opinions. People will listen, right? But that's me being a speaker. Then I'm a, there are times when I'm a preacher. Yeah. And when I'm a preacher, uh, if you take out the, like, uh, you know, s jokes about the Simpsons and, you know, whatever I have in the sermon. I, I, there, my hope is that there, it, there is at least one line in the sermon that somebody hundreds of years from now could read and they, they, they would feel in their body, oh, that's the gospel of the Lord. That's the gospel, mm. right? Mm. Uh, because I'm being a preacher, that's a different kind of authority. Take out all those stupid references I put in my my sermons, hopefully there's something that feels like the gospel. So Paul, in his letters, there are times where I will read a verse from Paul and in my body I'll be like, 
that is the gospel. Like, it's so clear. It rings like a bell. You can hear it, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's other times where he's being a speaker. He's, he's writing his snotty opinions about what the, he was a church planter and he had some authority. He was a good communicator. He had all these relationships. People yes, listened to him, but he was being a speaker, yeah. right? He, those are his yeah. opinions. Yeah. So how dare we take these opinions that are rooted in that moment of authority yeah. and then go, the gospel of the Lord, you know, as if it's the same as when we read that verse and go, I feel that. Yeah, that's good. This is just a very selfish question. I would like a picture, if you don't mind. The little girl in me is rejoicing that there's two women pastors up in front. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I so appreciated what you said about um, that it's all, it's all fair game because it's the living word. Yeah. But I wonder what advice you might have, how, how to respond when the use of that language, it's all fair game, is manipulated to weaponize the gospel. Say, say the last thing again. I didn't when, when, it, when the use of the language of, well, it's fair game. This is, my, this is how I read it. But it's mm -hmm. used to weaponize the gospel oh, and to weaponize okay. uh -huh. the good news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, do you and you know each other? <laughs> no, no. I'm, do you know each other? No. Because she came in and she's like, I'm Catholic. And uh, it's the first time I've been to this church. So you guys should, okay, exchange numbers. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. I'm like Bumble. And you're both welcome. Church yeah. Bumble. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, so here's, here's what I think that is categorically different about saying, uh, like weaponizing scripture and me saying like, hey, it's all fair game in terms of interpretation and the lenses and stuff is that, one has a humility to it, and one does not have a humility to it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that I, I can sense the Holy Spirit when there's some kind of true humility to an enterprise, to, because I'm very suspicious of human beings in general, and I'm suspicious of all of our machinations and our little enterprises, right? But if there's a shred of humility to it, I feel like that's the entry point for the Spirit. Mm -hmm. I... I uh, Paul's uh, list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, if it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, like that, yep. those are some parameters by which we measure authority, authority and truth. Is it greater? Is are it more of this mm -hmm. in the world or less of this? Mm -hmm. Is it including people in or excluding? And then you say, and it's free, to, free reign to say, yeah, not a good interpretation. There are better interpretations than that interpretation. That's fine, but no, I'm not taking on that one. Thanks mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. One more question. It better be a good one. No pressure. Uh, one, one question, and yep, great. What can we look forward to in your next book? Ah. Um, no pressure. I, <laughs> I had no idea how much I would enjoy not writing a book. But um, I highly recommend it. I really do. Uh, so I am not really writing a book right now. Um, but uh, maybe I will in the future if it stirs in me. But all my writing is I just I, I put online at this point. I am, I'm not putting it in books right now. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The corners. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you at home, wherever, home, wherever the camera is. Thank you for those who are live streaming and, and uh, participating with us. Uh, next week, we will have Dr. Christy Cobb. She's a, a young uh, scholar from uh, University of Denver, new New Testament scholar, and she's going to speak next week on slavery and gender in the Gospel of Luke. Um, so please do come, continue in this series, um, and tell your friends. Um, so anyways, thank you for coming, and thank you again.